so now we have we do have some time for discussion. Um, and if you've got something, if you've got a question you'd like to ask uh, or a comment that you'd like to have a response to, uh, put it in the chat and I will um, get it out there for the, the speakers. I'll start out. Um, I've got a couple of uh, things that, that kind of popped up during the presentation that kind of cut across all of the authors. Um, and in particular, one thing that, that kind of jumped out to me was during the second half of the or the presentations when we started talking about the more of, about the socio uh, ecological aspects of it uh, in Haley's talk uh, ranchers felt like they were they felt confident in their ability to manage ecology they um, they um, felt like they had more practices uh, in the uh, Thing that Leslie showed, uh, same thing with Anna. But yet, when we look at the data that Ken showed, that uh, that Duroc showed, uh, we're not seeing any improvements out there. And in many cases, we're seeing uh, declines in the in the, the in the ecological conditions. So, is is there a disconnect between what we think? land managers know and what land managers think they know and what's really coming out on the ground or what the uh, the monitoring data is telling us. Uh, obviously, anybody that would like to take that one on, feel free. Okay, if nobody's going to volunteer, I'll call on someone. Um, Haley, that was uh, your data that I referred to specifically. Um, would you care to respond to that? Okay, Haley may be on another, uh, I think she had two symposia scheduled this morning. Duroc uh, has got his hand up. Duroc, please go ahead. Hey, I'm happy to bail us out here. Uh, <laughs> so, sir, or dig us in deeper. Yeah, yeah, I might. Um, I think it's a great point. You can see it throughout the themes. There's, <clears throat> I mean, when we're talking about the, the challenges of transformation on big scale issues like these, it's not like when we're talking about global change drivers and we're living, we're the living experiment. So, uh, the connection between theory and practice is, I think, really what you're what you're hitting on. That and Leslie did a really nice job uh, showing that as well. So one of my favorite questions I would always ask in discussions tied to resilience is like, "Well, show me what successful resilience actually looks like," because um, we'd see where we're applying, say, adaptive management, you know, and to try and benefit that, or where we have these demonstration sites or case studies, you know. But long term proven success is is really hard and that was even with more local issues let alone global change drivers so we're talking about the theory and pathways to actually guide transformation in the face of those kind of threats uh, we're, we're basically being tested as a profession of how good we are and so if we can we have seen where there's groups just like Heidi was talking about that have risen that have had scales of success and more beneficial outcomes uh, than what we've tracked in the past. So there are, there are successful examples out there, but they're so exceedingly rare. And I really liked what Brandon set up because that determines you know, that RAD framework, like you can't really resist global change pressures if you don't have the cultural will to do it. So uh, Heidi and, and Leslie, we're really talking about that cultural will aspect and how to help reinforce it, um, let alone the guidance and resources and, and sufficient external capacity to support that willpower. So it's not gonna be, it's definitely not gonna be easy, but we are seeing some signs of success out there. But by and large, yeah, I think it is good for us to take a step back and say, well, wait a minute, how good are we at the profession? Are we adapting sufficiently enough? Or, is the old habits and what we used to prioritize 
going to work this century, given we've got novel pressures and change. So uh, a great overview, I think, by the group to try and frame like the challenge we have going forward. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Go ahead. Um, just to follow up on, on that point, Durak, um, I think it's also important for us as we think about climate change to define and maybe redefine what success is. Um, it was interesting from the Restore New Mexico data um, that some of the treatments that we, that, uh, we saw uh, where shrubs were removed with herbicides didn't increase grasses, but the controls, in the controls, the grasses decreased. So, so we may be, you know, we may be fighting against a tide uh, and we're expecting things to change back to what they were, but maybe in a lot of cases, just trying to stay where we're at, even if it's not what we hope it would be, is good enough or is as good as we can expect. Okay, thank you, Brandon. Um, there is a question uh, from Claire Hydock. Uh, no one, nobody mentioned environmental groups. Do any of the collaborative groups have buy-in from them? Or are they, or were they invited to be part of those groups? So Joel, I'll just grab this from um, in in our all of our work. We include all of the stakeholders um, on rangelands, those folks with vested interest in the sustainability and conservation of these landscapes. So that includes environmental and conservation groups. I don't know what specific groups are think they're they're asking about, but um, yeah, I mean uh, Nature Conservancy, Audubon California, Point Blue Conservation. Um, Defenders of Wildlife, all these, all these different groups we have worked with over the years because um, they do bring a really important perspective to these conversations as well. So I, and I, you know, without going into specifics, I think and I'm fairly familiar with most of those, um, most of the people involved in these presentations. And I think uh, er, environmental groups, uh, as well as, you know, the traditional conservation districts and all of that every uh, all had a lot of involvement from not not necessarily from landowners but from the interested public and i, I um, didn't i didn't bring it in um because you know we don't have three hours for each presentation but um some previous work that that we had done in terms of collaborative adaptive management um we were able to really uh see and demonstrate the value of you know, not just the traditional rangeland users, but also environmental groups um, working together to help connect, you know, different goals and methods in terms of um, reaching um, different objectives. And we saw that, you know, those groups that were mixed, mixed groups, you know, including environmental uh, ranching and rangeland professional type groups, those groups uh, made more connections, um, you know, between um, methods and practices to reach a, a stated goal than the groups that were more insular or you know, were uh, you know, just a single type of, of uh, rangeland stakeholder. So it's a good, it's a good point to ask about. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, Haley, I noticed that you're back. I've got a uh, question for you uh, that came up a little bit earlier um, and I'll, I'll, without going into great detail, I'll summarize it. Um, are we overrating ourselves in our abilities, uh, both as professionals and land managers to respond to these uh, pressures? I think that our social science would suggest there's a lot of opportunity for us to just see the bigger scales and think about them. It doesn't mean we can't do anything. When I was talking to Peter Adler about my presentation, he said, so we have to solve all of society's problems just to, to work on climate adaptation. That just doesn't seem like we're gonna get anywhere. 
And, and that really made me think. And I, th I, I thought, well, no, but we could at least talk about it. We could at least talk about it. And, um, and so the point I think I was trying to drive home is, you know, we can get really good at even grazing association or national forest scale of adaptive management. And we can use all the science, but we still have these social, these social challenges and what are we really doing about them and, and where, 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 what creative ideas do folks have? And that's why I like that idea of imagination from sociology. <laughs> that's kind of what science can do. I get a lot of grief. You guys have heard me present. I'm a first generation PhD. So when I go home to my folks, they're like, what do you do? You just sit around and think of new stuff and we pay you to do that. Um, but kind of, I think <laughs> there's like, there's a place where range science can really start to imagine a different future. Let's run these scenarios. Let's talk about um, whether it's policy or collaborations or research or action or education, the things that we can do. Um, because ranchers are really good at being ranchers. They're really good at keeping baby calves alive. They're really good at managing and understanding um, some of these rangeland ecology issues. You know, I don't see a lot of overgrazing. We these bigger challenges um, are going to take some other tools, and and so let's just talk about it. I guess is the kind of the point that I'm I don't, I'm trying to get across. I don't know what y'all think though. Aaron Miller uh, has a hand up. Aaron, question? Yeah. Hi, Joel. Thanks. Um, just to comment on how we talk about things, uh, I feel like in a lot of cases um, we're not being completely transparent or honest about the way that we talk about certain functions, such as, I'll use the example of, of in a state transition model, you know, we often include the arrow to, um, you know, some kind of state one or, or a reference state. And that arrow uh, represents a pathway or tran transition that involves building back organic matter or soil organic matter or soil organic carbon or topsoil. Um, but, you know, at least here in the Southwest, that's not really something that happens. Uh, doesn't matter how you change your management. It's, these are things that don't really occur on human timescales. And often we include these in, in our conversations or, or um, you know, a list of things you can do to improve your, your land management or to become more resilient for climate change. But, you know, those are... I guess I'm not sure how transparent we're being in how practical or feasible something like that really is. And I guess, I don't know if anybody else has a similar feeling about that. I'd be curious to hear what others think. Okay, Aaron, I, I think that's a very good point. And that's one that I think we can, uh, you know, I, I think we've got everything that we need to address those issues right there in front of us. Uh, you know, we've, we've got the way to communicate, we've got the pathways to communicate. Um, we certainly have the receptive audience and, and we've got the knowledge. So, um, you know, all the tools are there. Maybe it's just a matter of, of how we deploy them. So with that question, uh, that leaves me just enough time to uh, again, thank all of the participants the audience, we had uh, almost 100 people at one point. Uh, I very much appreciate everyone's respect for the speakers uh, and uh, managing your, uh, your devices there and um, making sure that we came off on time, thanks to the speakers. Uh, outstanding presentations, very much addressing the topic and the questions as well as a, a really nice job of presenting uh, to the subject and within the time frame that we've been allotted. So thank everybody. Um, like we said, this is being recorded and it will be posted in several places. Um, so I think we've got something to go ahead with and I'm gonna call this one successful. So thank you um, and we'll see you later. <laughs>